For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Every once in a while, someone will call my office and they will say, I'm on my way to your church and I can't find my way. How can I get to you from where I am? So you wanna guess what my first question is? Where are you? And sometimes they will say I'm in North Park and sometimes they will say they're on Brant School Road or someplace on McKnight or Perry Highway. Sometimes they'll say I have no idea where I am, I'm lost. And so I'll say, well, what's around you? What do you see? And one time someone said to me, I'm at a Panera Bread place. And I said, great, which one? And they said, the one right in front of me which wasn't very helpful, so I hung up on them. <laughs> no, I didn't do that, I wouldn't do that. If you want to determine where you are going and how you are going to get there, you first, have a, you first must have a sense of where you are, right? So during the past year or so, Ingemar Church has tried to identify who we are and where we are as a church so that we may discover who we are being called to be and how we are going to get there. We have continually asked the question, what does God have in mind for Ingemar Church? When God sits back with his feet up and dreams about the future of our church, what are those dreams that God has for us? What does God hope Ingemar Church will be? What does God want for us? Well, we began this stepped up strategic planning process last July. Using the five practices as a framework, our leadership council shared their own thoughts and perceptions. We sought to be open to God's guidance. We listened carefully to the staff, hearing their plans and their vision for ministry. We held three all-church meetings to hear what you wanted us to hear and to do. And throughout those meetings, we discovered these categories of people that God has placed on our doorstep. There are people who visit our church through events like Another Christmas Story and concert, chorale concerts and some of the plays that we do. There are children and parents of our preschool, the largest preschool in Western Pennsylvania. They are people who come and could come more and get more involved. You know, I knew very little about Ingemar Church before I was asked to come and serve as your pastor. But the one thing that I heard more than once was about this large preschool that was part of this church's ministry. And they said that the preschool was this gold mine of families that could be invited to Ingemar. And I also heard again and again that the church wasn't doing everything that it could to bring them into the life of the church. Well, now we are doing more, thanks to people like Robin Macon and Bonnie Getkin and Catherine Baker and Paula Meverden. These families are at a place in their lives where they are open to invitations to church. Many of these families are suddenly considering matters of faith for themselves and their children because of where they are in life. And you see, friends, we have what they are seeking. And so this is the focus of our reach. We do not want to exclude anyone from our church, but these groups are right under our noses. Let's retrace our steps. Ingemar Church began when some families in what was once a farming community came together and said, we need a church for ourselves and for others in the area. 
We need a place where we can worship our Creator and our Redeemer, a place where we can teach our children and one another about Jesus Christ. That was 175 years ago. And the church remained small for a while, as you could tell by the buildings that you saw. But as more and more people moved into this area, the church reached out to them. They ministered to them, and eventually Ingemar Church grew larger and larger and larger. Dr. Jack Parks served Ingemar Church from 1952 to 1982. 30 years. But here's the cool part of this story. Anticipating the migration of people to the suburbs of the North Hills of Pittsburgh, church leaders at the time sought a pastor. In 1952, they sought a pastor who could preach, who could lead, a pastor who had a heart for reaching new families as they moved into the area, a pastor who would remind his church that being the church means reaching out to others and always being willing to invite and to serve. And during his time, this church grew from 224 people to almost 1,900 people. Some called him Moving Van Jack. Probably not to his face. Because legend had it that once he spotted a moving van, he would stop, he would introduce himself, sometimes he would help the families carry boxes, and he would always, always invite them to Ingemar Church. As more families attended, as more families moved into the area, preschool education and child care became a major concern, a major issue in our community. And Ingemar Church met this need head on. Eventually, they built a separate facility across the street from the original church building. That's the building that you see out that way, just to accommodate families with young children. Not only did we have preschool, but for a while, we had kindergarten as well. Today, that's called the Ingemar Child Enrichment Center. It's still a vital ministry of our church to the community, and it has an incredible reputation. Now, friends, way back then, Ingemar Church was committed to welcoming new people, to worshiping God, to learning about Jesus, to serving others and giving to enhance the kingdom of God in the world. And today we call those same practices radical hospitality and passionate worship and intentional faith development and risk-taking mission and service and extravagant generosity. They are the five practices of fruitful congregations from the book written by Robert Schnazy. They are fundamental characteristics, fundamental characteristics of great churches. They are foundational pillars. They are the strength point of every church that is effective and fruit-bearing and life-changing. Radical, unapologetic, you are the most important person in the world at this particular moment, hospitality. Passionate, God is so awesome, so good, so great that I get chills when I think about his love for me, worship. Intentional, the more I learn about God, the more I love God and believe in him, faith development. Risk-taking, I have the power to impact the lives of others, mission and service. Extravagant, I am so blessed by God that I want to share with what I have with others. Generosity. The leaders of our church, reflecting on where we have been and where we are and where we think God is leading us, have looked through the lens of these five practices. They're solid. They make sense for us. They are profound, and if you consider the history of our church, they are in the DNA of our church. They are what our church was doing 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. Now, sometimes our church has lapsed in a few of these areas, which has interfered in our ability to be the church that God is leading us to be. And so the leadership of our church is saying that we want the five practices to define us as a church. And we want to live out these five practices as a church and as people in the church. 
We want to do them as best we can all the time. We are convinced that if we dedicate ourselves to them and we do them well, all of them, that we will become a great church, that we will become the church that God wants us to be, a church that is radically hospitable and passionately worshipful and intentionally developing people's faith and willing to take risks to serve and extravagantly generous, a church, a church that makes life better and transforms the world. Over the past couple of years, and especially since July 1st of last year, we have focused on the future of our church as a church seeking God's way. Our mission continues to be to reach people with the good news of Jesus and together become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We affirm the fact that in John 10.10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. And so we think our church exists to make life better for us and for those who have yet to come here and for those whose lives we will eventually touch through serving and giving. Our vision is to make lives better and transform the world by valuing each person and guiding them into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If we're gonna do that, if we're gonna do that, we have to get these five practices right. They must exist at the core of our being. Every leader, every committee and leadership team needs to practice them and practice them well. They're not options. And then every one of us, every one of us who wants to see us become what God wants us to be, the church God created us to be, will need to do them as well. You see, that's how churches become great. That's how they become God-honoring, faithful churches. And that's what we want, right? I mean, that's what we want, right? Hopefully all of us want that for our church. <laughs> Hopefully we all want to be God's church. Not your church or my church, but God's church. But you know that can be a problem, right? Because some churches really like being comfortable. Some churches care more about themselves than they care for others. It's very tempting. A few months ago, I was describing our visioning and planning process to a fellow pastor, and he told me of a church that he once served where they did this extensive strategic planning process. They brought in a consultant, and they laid out this incredible plan, and then they took it to the church who considered it. The church said, no. No. We don't want to do that. We like who we are, and we like who's here, and we don't care to have a bunch of people around here that we don't know. We'd rather not change. The pastor said it broke his heart to hear that. And I'll tell you, friends, unless that thinking changes, the future of that church has already been decided. There is no place in Scripture, neither in the teachings of Jesus or in the writings of Paul, where the church is encouraged to be self-centered, navel-gazing, and discouraged from reaching beyond its walls. So how do we get started? Well, think of each of the five practices and figure out a way to improve that practice in your own life. And of course, here I am to offer suggestions. Radical hospitality. Be friendlier. Be more welcoming. Be more outgoing. You're probably good at the first two. The third one might be a struggle. Smile at people. Look people in the eye as you pass them in the hall. Say hello. Introduce yourself to people if you don't know their name. Can we all agree, can we all agree that we are willing to look and feel stupid asking people their names just so we can be more hospitable? 
Greet people in the parking lot. You know, the first person in this church who greeted Tony and I when we came to visit this church in March of the year that I had just been appointed and I didn't come until July was Lee Chandler. We were walking, we had parked across the street and we walked across the street and we were walking up to this door and Lee was coming in from another direction and he walked out of his way to come and welcome us. He had no idea who we were, no idea who I was. I miss him because he had such a great passion to reach new people and such a desire for Ingemar Church to be all that it could be. The second one, passionate worship. Prepare to be a worshiper before services begin. Remember on Saturday night that you will be worshiping on Sunday morning. Pray about coming to worship before you arrive. Prepare to encounter God in worship. Arrive early or at the very least on time. Listen to the prelude at 9 or at 11.15. We have this amazing organ. And we have this even more amazing organist. And if you don't come early, you almost never get to hear him unless you're listening to him accompany the hymns. Sit closer. That's how I met Jesus. I am easily distracted by things in front of me. And so when I started to go to church, at a point in my life, I began to sit closer. I sat in the first or the second row, and I felt like the speaker was speaking directly and only to me, or that at least God was speaking to me through him, and, and, and he was. And I still do that. I still try to sit close. Open yourself up to God and ask God to help you to receive what God wants you to receive that day. Invite God to have his way with you every time you come to worship. Intentional faith development. This one's easy. You can probably tell me what I'm going to tell you. Join a small group whether it's a Bible study or a Sunday school class or whatever, you will meet people, you will increase your understanding of God and Jesus, you will approve your awareness of God, and you will deepen your faith. Listen carefully, friends. Even Jesus was in a small group. Just do that. Risk-taking mission and service, do, th- do something for someone else. Take dinner to Bethany House or Pleasant Valley Men's Shelter. Sort donated goods at World Vision or Global Links. Work with Habitat for Humanity. Go to Philippi, West Virginia, or Kenya, or Honduras. Send packages to soldiers. Extravagant generosity. Give out of your abundance. Do you know this church so far has given $103,000 to clean water? And we have sent money to Honduras for water filtration, and we've sent money to Uganda to dig wells, and we've sent money to Kenya to dig wells. World Vision has asked us to partner with them and others to provide a massive water project in Ghana, West Africa. And this project would provide clean, safe water and sanitation and hygiene to about a million people. A source of funding through World Vision has offered to match every dollar we give with four dollars of their own. Give like crazy. To our monthly mission focus, we believe in these ministries and we perceive that they are credible and worthwhile. Bethany House, Hearth, Light of Life, Rescue Mission, the whole list of them. And you can be involved in these places as well, hands on, so you should do that. Give to support our church. We have awesome facilities that demand upkeep and repair. Our staff is amazing. They are skilled and gifted and passionate about the roles that they play. I believe if we improve the way we do the five practices, radical hospitality, passionate worship, intentional faith development, risk-taking mission and service, and extravagant generosity, that our church will accelerate 
it will accelerate on its way to becoming the church God wants us to be. It will be the church on steroids. In a good way. But that's just the first step. That is the first step. By doing so, we will create a solid foundation upon which we can establish a strong God-honoring church, and then we will, be, we will be positioned to move ahead by leaps and bounds. I believe that if every one of us commits ourselves to doing these five practices, then we will, and our church will, just take off. Average attendance will double within the next two years because people will hear about this place, and they will want to come. By the way, you know that we could double worship attendance next week if we wanted, right? Because all you need to do is bring one person. Every person here, bring one person. Why don't we do that? And if we dedicate ourselves to these practices, small group participation will equal 100% of our worship attendance. And that could happen in a heartbeat as well if each of us joined a group. So let's do that one too. And if we will devote ourselves to the five practices, everyone will be engaged in a mission project and everyone will be giving so that lives will be changed. Friends, we have what the world needs. Why keep it a secret? We have the truth about God's love for all Jesus' gift of his life for all, the presence of God dwelling in each of us as the Holy Spirit. Some don't see the need that they have yet, but we do. And they will. And so our purpose is to reach people with the good news of Jesus and together become fully devoted followers of Christ. And our vision is that God is calling us to make lives better and transform the world by valuing each person and by guiding them into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, friends, we have the power. We have the power to make life better and to change the world. So let's do that. Let's do that. None of us lives forever. On the day that I die, I hope to hear three things from Jesus. One will be, well, yes, you made it. This is heaven. <laughs> and the second would be, well done, good and faithful servant. Receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the third would be, man, there's a whole slew of people here from Ingemar Church. Jack Parks, Frank Hess, Lou Bishop, Larry Hauk, Bill Barrel, Nell Marsh, Kathy Franz, Peg Hodgson, Lee Chandler. There's a whole mess of them. You guys got it right. You guys got it right. Way to go. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Let us pray. Well, God, we have this wonderful gift called Ingham, our church. And we have this wonderful gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who loves us and suffered and died for us. And we have this incredible message of your love exhibited through Jesus. And we have this desire to be the church that you want us to be. God, we are a, uh, we're a pretty successful bunch here. Many of us have been very successful at everything that we have touched. And so the temptation may be that if we just gear up and step up, that we can accomplish all you have in store for us. But we need to remember that 
during this 175 years of history of our church, we've never been alone. You've always had your eye on us. You've always been rooting for us and hoping for us and praying for us. So help us to go forth in boldness, trusting in your presence. In your name we pray. Amen.